The first one is London Dispersion Forces, also just called Dispersion Forces. Now, London Dispersion Forces exist in every single molecule or atom that exists on Earth. There is always a slight attraction between atoms or molecules, even if we decide to ignore them like we did with our gas loss. So how exactly is that attractive force created? Well, if you look at it, this example, this is helium. If you have atom A and atom B, the electrons, which are shown on the top left and all of the top drawings right there, those electrons can be anywhere at any one instance. So if you look at the center diagrams, the one on the bottom, notice that the electrons happen to be lining up on the left-hand side of atom B. And since they are lining up on the left-hand side of atom B, because they can honestly be wherever, but they just happen to line up there, then the right-hand side of atom B is going to be partially positively charged. Well, since it's partially positively charged, that's going to have an effect on atom A, as you can see in, in the C diagrams. The partial negative is going to repel the electrons in atom A, causing the left-hand side of atom A also to be partially negatively charged, while the right-hand side of atom A will be partially positively charged. And so that separation of charges, even though it's very slight, a slight difference in charges, that's going to cause an attraction. That attraction is called London dispersion forces. And so it exists in every single type of molecule, in every single type of atom. So while I'm going to be talking about three more types of intermolecular forces, all of these also have London dispersion forces. Now, London dispersion forces, when we're trying to list out all of the different types of intermolecular forces that molecules or atoms can have, if you have a nonpolar molecule, the only intermolecular force it will have is London dispersion forces. Now the other ones, or the other types of intermolecular forces I'm going to talk about, happen to be for polar molecules. So let's talk really briefly about how the strength of London dispersion forces can vary. And the term that I have to use in order to talk about that is polarizability. Now polarizability is the ease with which the charge distribution is distorted. And so when we're talking, when we're comparing the strength of different London dispersion forces, we're going to be using this term polarizability or how polarizable a molecule is. Now, as you can see from this chart right here, neon has a weaker intermolecular force, has a weaker London dispersion force than fluorine does. Argon has weaker than chlorine, krypton, than bromine, xenon, and iodine. Now, we know that because if you look, and I'm going to be talking about this in the next lesson, but that's because their boiling points are higher, which means they're holding on to one another much more tightly, which means that their intermolecular forces are stronger. So why are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, why do they have such a stronger intermolecular force, such a stronger London dispersion force? Well, that's because they are more polarizable. If you notice, all of those molecules have a larger mass than those noble gases that they're compared to. And so a molecule or an atom is more polarizable. It's easier to distort the charge and create this London dispersion force if they have more electrons and they have more electrons with larger masses. So when you're comparing the strengths of London dispersion forces, the more massive a molecule is or an atom is, the greater its mass the more electrons it has, and therefore the more polarizable it is. The other factor that influences the strength of London dispersion forces is the molecular shape. If you compare n-pentane versus neopentane, notice that n-pentane has a linear structure while the other one is spherical. So notice that n-pentane, because it has a higher boiling point, that means it has a stronger London dispersion force. And this is because there's a larger surface area in which those two molecules can interact with one another. So not only the more massive, but also the more surface area a molecule has, the stronger the London dispersion forces. Molecular shape can be hard to determine without drawing it out. So the easiest one to determine is to compare mass. However, if you're given the shapes of two molecules and asked to compare, just identify which has a larger surface area and that will be the one that has stronger London dispersion forces. The next type of intermolecular force is dipole-dipole forces. Now, dipole-dipole forces only occur between polar molecules. 
And that's because those, and remember, those polar molecules have a permanent dipole. And so dipole-dipole forces are those attractions between dipoles, the partial positive and the partial negative, that we saw in London dispersion forces, but it's permanent. And so as a result, it causes molecules to be even more attracted to one another. So molecules that are polar, they will have London dispersion forces, but dipole-dipole forces as well, which puts them over the edge, which means that they have an even stronger attraction between one another than nonpolar molecules. And the strength of dipole-dipole forces increases as you increase the polarity of the molecule. And you get to the point in which the difference in polarity is so great that you no longer have dipole-dipole forces. You instead have the third type of intermolecular force, which is hydrogen bonding. So if you look at this right here, in order to have hydrogen bonding, you need a hydrogen that is bound to either an oxygen, a nitrogen, or a fluorine, as you can see here, and then it's going to be attracted to another oxygen, fluorine, or nitrogen. And the reason why hydrogen bonding is so much stronger than London dispersion forces and dipole-dipole forces is because there is a great difference in electronegativity between oxygen and hydrogen. And so as a result, hydrogen there is going to be very partially positively charged, and the oxygen, fluorine, and nitrogen are going to be very partially partially negatively charged. And so that attraction is going to be even greater than it was in dipole-dipole because of the great difference in polarity. So that's the third type of intermolecular force. Remember, for hydrogen bonding, you need fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen. It is fun. Uh, hydrogen bonding is fun. But those hydrogens need to be bound to an oxygen, fluorine, or a nitrogen as well. So I'm going to go through just a couple of additional notes that you need to know as far as intermolecular forces are concerned. So the first one is that hydrogen bonding is going to be stronger than dipole-dipole normally, which is going to be stronger than London dispersion forces. So typically, London dispersion forces are your weakest type of intermolecular attraction, and hydrogen bonding is the strongest. However, if a molecule that has LDF is extremely large, meaning it has a lot of electrons, it's a huge molecule with a lot of electrons, it's possible for its intermolecular force, its London dispersion force, to be stronger than a molecule that has hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole, specifically a molecule that's much smaller than it. So you wouldn't be expected to be able to say, oh, well, this one's really big, this molecule's really big, this one's really small, this one has a lot more electrons than this one, therefore it's going to have a stronger intermolecular attraction. Instead, what will happen is a question would say, Despite our prediction that, for example, something a molecule that has hydrogen bonding would have a stronger intermolecular force, what's observed is that this molecule that only has London dispersion forces actually has a stronger intermolecular force. Explain why. And so it is possible if, some, if a molecule only has London dispersion forces, it is stronger for it to have a stronger intermolecular force if it has, and you would explain it by saying, it has a significantly larger number of electrons, therefore it is much more polarizable, which overcomes the strength of hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole forces. So this is an exception and not a rule, because typically hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole attractions are stronger than London dispersion forces. And finally, how do we actually observe the strength of intermolecular forces? Well, one way is with vapor pressure. So vapor pressure actually tells you how much gas there is. So if you have a high vapor pressure, that means you have a lot of gas molecules. And so therefore, the higher your vapor pressure is, the weaker a molecule's intermolecular forces are, which makes sense. Because remember, in order for a molecule to become a gas, it has to break all of its intermolecular attractions. So if a gas has a high vapor pressure, that means there are a lot of gas molecules, which means it's, it was easier for it to become a gas, which means its intermolecular forces were weaker. Okay? In contrast, if we're looking at boiling point or melting point, if a molecule has a really high boiling, boiling point or melting point, in order to boil or melt, remember you're breaking intermolecular attractions. So, and that the attraction between the molecules. So if you have a really high boiling point, a molecule is going to have a really high boiling point because it holds, the molecules hold on to one another much more tightly. They have a stronger intermolecular force. So those are just two things that you can actually measure in the lab in order to, com to compare intermolecular forces. The higher your vapor pressure, the weaker your intermolecular forces because 
your molecules being able to become a gas more easily. Whereas the higher your boiling point or the higher your melting point, the stronger your intermolecular force is.